everyone. Thanks for not going to the uh, happy hour, which was apparently said this morning was at this time. So I was expecting nobody to be here and everyone drinking beer or something. So I appreciate you coming out. Um, if there is beer, feel free to go and grab one and then come back. Okay, so I'm here uh, to talk for the next 20 minutes or so about open sourcing uh, PHP packages. Uh, first, a little bit about myself. My name's Jonathan. I live in Canada. I've been writing PHP for 17, 18 years, and uh, much of that time I've spent at a marketing agency. Uh, but in the last three years or so, I've started doing contract development, freelance work. Uh, so working at home with my daughter, you know, which is really nice. So I've enjoyed that. Outside of my work, I, uh, I try to stay as involved in open source as I can. It's always challenging finding time, but I really do enjoy it. Most of the work I do is with the PHP League, also known as the League of Extraord Extraordinary Packages. Bit of a silly name, but that's, uh, that's what it is. Um, so our goal is to build uh, high quality PHP frameworks that are framework agnostic. Uh, and we currently have around 30 packages. Interesting note, like worldwide, I think our packages amount for something like, uh, in the PHP land, something like the top four pack uh, largest uh, most popular packages so on github that I that is at least okay so what is a package really simply package is a small or not small chunk of reusable code uh, it's typically focuses on solving one problem and one problem well it can be both open source but it could also be proprietary so it could be your own code typically we think of packages as open source and that's actually a lot of what this talk will, will be referring to. And packages are delivered via package manager. So in PHP, that's Composer. Packages are important because they provide code that you don't have to write. Um, that saves businesses time and money. Uh, and it wasn't always that way in PHP. For, for a long, long time, reusable existing quality code didn't exist. And we spent a lot of time writing our own stuff, implementing our own code. Uh, and re-implementing and rewriting these things over and over and over um, and not really sharing basically a general knowledge. Today there is about 140,000 packages available on Packagist, uh, Packagist being the main composer repository. Uh, that's actually up. I looked, I did this talk a year ago and that's up 92,000 packages from one year ago. Uh, so these combine for roughly 285 million downloads or installs every month. So that's pretty cool. If you're interested in knowing more stats, Packages actually has a page on their site, just a packages.org slash statistics, uh, which gives you a rundown. It's kind of cool. Packages are a big part of what makes a, um, a language successful. So if you think of good, you know, popular languages, a lot of times they'll have a solid package manager and a sol solid package ecosystem along with them. So I think of like gems in Ruby or NPM for Node or pip for Python and kind of the list goes on. So they're kind of an integral piece of a good uh, code ecosystem. And uh, modern PHP is thriving with them. Every, you know, I was just in Nils' talk earlier and he said that Composer's been around for six years now and it's had such an incredible impact on the PHP, uh, the whole ecosystem. Basically everyone is using uh, packages in Composer now. Um, so I would say, kind of before I get into more of the, the meat of this talk, I would say if you've never contributed to open source, if you've never created a, pack, created a package before, I'd highly encourage you to try it. Um, it can be either a new project or jumping in on an existing project. I think a lot of the best packages start when you're dealing with some real world problem that you're doing at work uh, and you're, you're solving something. If you look at a piece and s you say, hey, you know, I might be able to use this on another project, or you think hey, this might be useful to other people, that might be a good opportunity to create a package. And they don't have to be big. They can be really small, simple things. Um, maybe not as simple as the left pad package in NPM, but still, they can, be, uh, they can be smaller. They don't have to be big things. So contributing to open source obviously helps P the PHP ecosystem, but it's also, I think, a good learning. It's a good, you know, just a good thing for your own career. 
think by getting involved in developing something that's used by lots of people, it trains you and it gives you a set of skills that you wouldn't necessarily get uh, just in your day-to-day -day work. I've certainly felt that through my experience, and I've heard that from others as well. And I would say if your business relies heavily on certain packages, those are maybe good places to get started. So again, referring back to Nils' talk, he talked about the idea that you know, packages are ultimately ha come with risk for a company. So if a, you know, that package could disappear and the package maintainer s just stops working on it or whatever. So if there are certain packages that your business relies on, those might be good places as a company to invest time, developer time, helping the person with that project. Okay, so creating packages can be a little bit intimidating at first. Uh, I found that out when I got involved in it. Uh, so what I did is I actually, I did a talk a number of years back on the same topic, but at that time I put together a checklist, and it's a really long, silly domain, but it's called the phppackagechecklist.com. And what I d basically did with this site is I created a whole list of all the things you basically need to cover off in order to have uh, a package essentially be taken seriously by the rest of the PHP community. Um, and it's not always about the uh, code. It's actually, a lot of the stuff is not about the code at all. It's just kind of the stuff, the ancillary stuff that goes along with releasing a package that you, you need to learn. Um, but if you have never gone through it before, you maybe, maybe wouldn't realize. All right, this is what it looks like. Just a simple site, nothing fancy. I've done my very best to keep it really short and simple and you can pre probably read through the whole site in about five minutes. And it's also, you can actually check them off and create little mini reports, which is nice um, if you wanna share, s share a little report with someone about their package. Okay, so let's, uh, um, yeah, I was just gonna note that I generally the, the recommendations in this, uh, on that website are for open source packages, not for private packages, but there's obviously a lot of overlap there that you know it's beneficial to know for both. Okay, so starting with number one, pick a name wisely. This can be a hard thing at first, and especially because you're just creating a package, you don't necessarily want to get into like this marketing exercise and this branding exercise, but it's good to put a little bit of thought into the name you choose. Also, try to find like a unique identifier that you can use in your name, in your package name, that makes it easy for people to want just call it, and two, it makes it easy for people to find it. Um, searchability is really important when it comes to this stuff because somebody's trying to solve a problem, they want to be able to jump on Google and be able to search for your package or your library name and find it easily. So here's a bunch of PHP pack package names that I think have done well. They're easy to find. I'm sure you're familiar with a lot of these. Um, so try to find something along those lines. Also try to pick a name that isn't used by another project already. So maybe, again, doesn't sound like a super big deal, but uh, it can get kind of messy sometimes when two projects, especially similar, you know, projects that are similar in nature, share the same name. Um, I've had, I have this with one of my projects. It's named, there's another, there's an Android library that's similar to my PHP package. It does image stuff. And I keep getting posts from the Android library on my PHP project issues on GitHub, people asking for help. And I'm like, no, sorry, this is different project. And they're like, no, it's the same project. I'm like, no, I, I promise you it is a different project. So, and that's really on me because that other project was around before I created mine. So that's, that's my bad. And also, you know, ma I mentioned left that left pad package for NPM earlier. Um, that whole disaster that happened, I don't know if anyone remembers last year when NPM had this one thing break with this one package go offline and tons of people's builds broke. Well, that was all caused by a naming conflict that eventually ended ugly where the developer just said, fine, if I can't have this name or whatever, I'm just going to delete the package and that's what happened there. So that whole issue came from a naming problem. Um, Simple, maintain consistency between the name that you choose and the PHP package namespace. It's a minor point, but it's just nice to do for consistency. It's what people expect. Avoid using last names or personal handles in your namespaces. This is a bit of a, maybe a lesser important uh, recommendation. It's maybe even debatable, but I think more and more people are moving away from this older recommendation where you, you know, people encourage you to put your name in there uh, or your personal handle. I think for Main, two main reasons. One, if you have your personal handle in there, it's more difficult to say, pass that package off to somebody else in the future because it now has your name you know, really in there. 
And I think the other thing it does is when you have a more generic name uh, and you don't include your personal stuff in the namespace, it just Im it's more inviting. It doesn't feel as much like a one-person one project. So here's some examples. Uh, I have my Glide project, so you could use Glide. We, under the PHP League, we, we have everything under the League namespace. Uh, and then maybe some things to avoid here. If my, if my library is called Glide, having a namespace called Images is probably a bad idea. Or PHP Glide is sort of silly because we all know that it's PHP because it's a PHP library. So it just a little bit of care there can go a long way just to keep things simple and understandable. Next one, host source openly. Uh, this is kind of obvious if we're talking open source, um, but it's important. Uh, back in the day, people used to take zip files and you'd download the zip file from somebody's website and hopefully that file download still worked. And, um, nowadays, we uh, host everything more openly uh, by generally putting it on GitHub, which I'm going to mention in a sec. Uh, by, by doing it this way, you, you kind of nail off three, three or four things. You, one, you invite people to contribute and participate. You, it's easier to download because it's in this public place. Uh, you can get code reviews done easier from people, and you can have bug reports submitted through the issue, uh, the ticket system. So it's 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 a good thing, and obviously for an open source, that's kind of critical. Uh, obviously, the recommendation here is GitHub. It's sort of become the de facto standard for open source software, um, which also means that you're going to have to use Git as well. So if you're using another version control system, uh, you're going to probably want to learn Git if you're going to open source stuff. So if you prefer Bitbucket or something else, uh, you may still want to continue using GitHub for this because it, your end users will most likely prefer that. Um, again, I've used Bitbucket for lots of side projects and personal projects, but I think for an open source project, it really makes sense on GitHub. Make sure that your library is auto-loader auto friendly. So it's 2017. We don't put includes at the top of our PHP files anymore. So your, your package should have some sort of autoloader friendly setup. Um, and it makes it a lot easier to work with. The obvious recommendation here is PSR4, which replaces, I believe it was PSR0, um, which is a PHP fig standard that came out, which just defines how, your, how you can autoload based on namespace and class names. So if you follow PSR4 and you're using Composer, then you don't have to include an actual autoloader in your library. It will just work. So then obviously, distribute it via Composer. Um, that's the obvious choice nowadays, and we're very grateful to have that. Like, as mentioned, it's been around for about six years now. Previously, we had other things like Pair, um, but uh, there was lots of problems with that. I won't get into that, but it really, having Composer is amazing, and it, you know, it, as I already mentioned, having a good package manager uh, is just such a critical thing in PHP to be able to, to, to make all this sort of code sharing in, uh, much easier to do. All right, so as I'm sure many of you are also familiar with, this is how you would actually install a library. So Composer require and then the actual library that you want to install. What you may not be familiar with is how you actually set up your library to be Composer ready. It's very sim similar to your Composer file that you'd have in your actual library except, or in your application, except this time in your library, it needs a little bit more information. So you got to give it a name. You give it any of your requirements or any of the, de the dependency for your package, and then also how you want to autoload it. So as mentioned, you can use PSR4, but there are other ways of autoloading files that you can tell Composer how to do that. And then so that's step one of actually getting it to work in Composer. Step two is you have to now host that on a uh, Composer um, repository, and the obvious one being Packages. That's the, the public one that everyone uses. And uh, to do that, you basically just go to their website, and you create an account. And uh, once you've created an account, you can enter in your package, and you'll be off to the races. One note, uh, you don't have to commit your composer.lock file to your library. So unlike your application code, where you always want to do that, you don't have to do that because Composer doesn't actually read the library composer.lock file. There are other benefits to doing it, but you don't have to. And another little small note around this is it's helpful to put your, so your actual code in your library in the source folder. Not a requirement by any stretch, but that's sort of just become a bit of a, 
de facto standard. So when people are browsing your, your code, they just it's an expected place to look. Framework agnostic. So this is something, obviously, with the PHP League, we try hard to do. All our code is framework agnostic. Simply means that it doesn't depend on a specific framework. And the obvious reason for doing that is to basically not limit your code if you don't have to. Now, there's certain situations where it does make sense to have uh, framework-specific libraries, but if you don't have to make it Zend or Symfony or Laravel specific, that just gives you more mileage with that library, and it can be useful to more people across you know, different ecosystems. One thing that you can do is if you want to support certain libraries or certain frameworks is you can offer uh, service providers. So service providers are really just simple little classes that basically tell uh, the framework how to load up your library. Um, this is pretty common, and, and every framework kind of has this a uh, bit of a different way that they do this. Um, but you can either ins include these service providers for whatever frameworks you want to supp like support right in your library, or you can actually create separate packages um, to do that. So that's actually what I did Sorry, right here. That's actually one of my libraries. I wanted to support, uh, for my Glide li library, I wanted to support you know, Cake, and I wanted to support Zend, and, and Slim, and Symfony, and all these different things. So I actually created different packages for each one of those, and each one of those packages basically just included a very simple service provider, plus it included the, the dependencies for the actual library. So if you want to use Symfony, Glide with Symfony, you just literally compose a requires Glide Symfony, and off you go. So there's benefits to having it in separate libraries, but I will say that it is more work doing it that way. Managing all these different libraries was kind of, a, it's a nuisance to be honest with you. But the benefit of it is, is for the testing side of it, I don't need to have in my dev dependencies, I don't have to have every single framework possible included in that. So when people install it, they don't install all, you know, six different frameworks that, that I offer support for. Um, so that's the main reason I do that. If you have more questions about that, talk to me after. Um, uh, another recommendation, which is always a bit of a fun one, is to follow a coding standard. Developers are picky about their white space. It's the point of lots of arguments. It doesn't have to be with open source stuff. Just follow a standard. We uh, on the list recommends PSR2, which is another PHP fig recommendation. Uh, it's not perfect, but it is a very well-known, well-supported standard. I would say it's definitely the most common code formatting standard in PHP today. And the benefit it brings is just the consistency. It makes it easy to jump into a project and start working on it and not be thrown off by weird code formatting. Yeah, so it makes it easy to contrib contribute to. And uh, there's already a lot of tooling around PSR2 as well. So if you have, like, on, on my computer system, for example, every time I save a PHP file, it automatically formats it to that standard. So and you can do this stuff quickly with, like I said, with something like uh, PHP Coding Standard Fixer, which is really helpful. Um, so you don't have to think about it. You literally just write your PHP code, and it'll correct any mistakes that you make along the way. And there's also services that you can use, like Nitpick or Style CI, which are basically just third-party services that work. Um, and anytime, say, you commit some code to your library, somebody else commits some code to your library, it'll run these standard checks against it. And if there's a violation, it'll just put a comment in the actual PR that says, hey, you broke the PSR2 standard. You needed a line return here or a comma there or whatever. All right, next recommendation, write unit tests. So this is probably an obvious one. Uh, it's so important to write unit tests for your packages. If you ex people who rely on your packages are expecting that you have a proper test suite in place. Um, it also helps a lot for maintaining the package because anytime you have someone submit something, you know right away, okay, it passes the test suite, so it must be half decently good. And it also helps for yourself. You know, all the benefits that you're gonna experience with you know automated testing with any of your stuff, you're gonna feel that as well with your open source packages. I always try to aim the majority of the code. You know, code coverage isn't everything, though. Some, somewhere, you know, 90 plus, I think, is good. PHP unit's a great choice. It's very common. It's very well understood by the, the, the PHP community. So that's obviously a very natural go-to choice as far as a testing framework. Uh, there are alternatives like PHP spec. This really comes down to me, it comes down to what's the need of your package, what are the type of things that you're testing, how do you need to test it, you kind of make that decision on a per package basis. Ideally though, you'll want this be to be able to be installed, uh, oops, you'll want that to be able to be installed by 
uh, composer to make it easy for people to install it and get it up and running and run your test suite. Doc block your code. So this is one that I have mixed feelings on because I actually hate doc blocks. But uh, a lot of people do this, and a lot of people with their open source stuff, they do doc blocks. Doc blocks are just the little pieces of comments, basically at the top of uh, functions and classes or methods. Uh, and they basically just add a little bit of extra information. So they serve as inline documentation. Uh, and they can also improve code coverage in, in IDs like PHP Storm and different things. And they can also be converted to API documentation, something like PHP Documenter. Uh, so again, I'm not a super big fan of doc blocks because I find that since they're comments, they have this bad habit of more often being wrong than right, and it's just another thing to have to maintain. I think there is maybe some merit with an open source project to, to doing it, uh, but I definitely don't think they're a replacement for documentation. I think documentation requires a human touch that doc blocks don't offer. All right, we're getting near the end here. Semantic versioning, if anyone was in Neil's talk, he, he was talking a lot about this. Semantic versioning is very, very important with an open source package. Uh, it basically uh, gives people the ability to safely upgrade the package that you offer without being fearful that the code is going to break something in their, their application. So it's, it's, a, it's basically a pattern that you follow when releasing new versions of your package. So it works like this. It's got major, uh, major minor, and patch. So that works out to breaking being the first one. Uh, new features generally being your minor and patch being any bug fixes. So the reason why you want to patch, you know, anytime you have a bug fix or a bug, you know, you, you, you fix the bug, you patch it, and then when people run Composer update, they're going to get that new version. So as mentioned, it, uh, it's critical for allowing developers to upgrade safely. And Composer works with semantic versioning, so you can actually tell Composer how exactly you want it to treat the, 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 va the versions of the packages that you're uh, updating. So you can either be quite liberal about this or you can be conservative. You can be very conservative. You can just say, you know what, I'm just going to install 1.0.1, or you can say, I want 1.0.x. Uh, you can give, you be very uh, specific about how you define your semantic versioning um, update, upgrade process. So go to semver.org if you want to know more information about that. And just a little aside here, when I first got started with doing this uh, open source stuff, I actually didn't even know how on earth to even release a, a, a package version. Uh, so it turns out that this is done using git tags. If you've never, I don't know, I never used git tags prior to that. So what you can do is you can basically say at any point in your Git history, you can define a tag. Uh, so that would be that the tag is specific to a, an actual commit. Uh, and that's how you actually define it, uh, a release. Uh, and then when you do that, when you define that, you can either do that straight through Git command line. But if you have it on GitHub, you can actually define them there under the releases section. So then as soon as you tag a release, it sends a, a hook off to packages, and packages knows that a new version is available. Keep a change log. This is a pretty simple and straightforward thing to do, but it's like really important. Uh, and not only like uh, if you're not a package maintainer and you're not writing packages, make sure you actually just read the chain lo change logs of the libraries that you're using. The point of this is to show notable changes that have been made between releases. So this is supposed to be like human readable, so not necessarily a list of all your commit messages because those can be a total gong show but you want something that people can look at and get a really quick summary of, okay, what changes happened in this version. Um, there's, of course, a format for this as well um, called the uh, keep a change log, keepachangelog.com format. I'm not too concerned. If you're interested, check out the website. I'm not con too concerned about the format other than to say it should obviously include a date, the version number, and a list of changes that have happened. Uh, so this is an example of my library of how I've done this. I'll often put links back into like relevant things as well. I'll create links to documentation, or I'll create links to issues, or I'll create links to a PR or whatever. This is a handy little thing. If you use GitHub Pages for your documentation, it just really it's basically an automated way. It'll read your doc, it'll read your change log from GitHub and automatically publish it on your your site. It's really handy. Okay, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to skip through the last ones pretty quickly. But uh, I would say I've already mentioned a little bit of the continuous integration stuff. So you can run uh, automatic, automatically run um, coding standard checks at the point that someone submits a PR. 
we also automatically run our test suite this way. So we use Travis CI to run all our tests. Anytime somebody commits any code to one of our libraries, we run a test suite. If the test suite fails, we let the person know. It's a really nice way of getting immediate feedback and you don't have to sell someone, hey, your, your, your PR is no good, it didn't pass the test. Well, they see that already, they'll be notified immediately. Another thing to have a look at is something called Scrutinizer. It's free for open source projects. It's really helpful for not necessarily, like it'll run your test suites, but it'll, it'll also do more than that. It'll find uh, potential bugs that you maybe don't even realize exist. Um, and it's got all cool sorts of metrics of how it does that, but um, something to check out as well. And then we use that for the league as well. Write extensive documentation. This is also really, really important. This is vital basically to the su success of an open source package, uh, but it takes some effort. I like this quote by uh, the technical writer for uh, the Rust documentation. Tests are hard, so we practice to get better. Docs are hard, so we don't write any and we complain, which is so true. Uh, so if you're gonna release an open source package, release documentation. If you're not prepared to release documentation or write documentation, don't even bother start. It's that important. Um, I mentioned that we use GitHub Pages. It's a free place to host documentation. It's Jekyll based. It's really easy to work with. Uh, if you want to learn more about my thoughts on documentation, come tomorrow at 11 a.m. because I'm totally nerdy about documentation and I'm going to go on about it for about an hour. Include a license. This is another thing that's easy to overlook. If you don't have a license, you can potentially be uh, hurting yourself or not protecting yourself, and it can also make it more difficult for people to consume your package because some companies actually have like licensing rules, so if your package has no license, they may not be able to use it, even though you have no problem with them using it if you don't have one defined. So if you're having a hard time, hard time choosing which license to use, check out chooseatlicense.com. That's what we use at the PHP League. It's really simple, it's really short, or sorry, uh, it'll, sorry, what we use at the League is not chooseatlicense.com, that'll help you choose one, sorry. What we use is the MIT license, which is, this is the whole thing. It's very short, it's very straightforward, but do take the time to read it if you're gonna put that on one of your packages. Um, and at a minimum, include this as a license file within your app, uh, within your source code, sorry, and also include it in your composer.json file because uh, Composer actually has the ability to show the license uh, using a Composer license command. So it'll read that from your Composer file. Okay, last one, welcome uh, contributions. This is a, just a simple thing, but it, I think it's, it shows a friendly nature. Uh, basically, if you want help on your library, ask for it. It's really that simple. And uh, the best thing to do is create a contributing file uh, to basically welcome people to help on the project, uh, explain basically how to get up and running on the project, how to install it, how to run the tests, how to check the coding standards, what the coding standards are, those sorts of things. All right, that's a crash course. That's all I had. Um, and I think it's uh, time for happy hour, but I'll, I'll have a couple minutes maybe for questions. Anybody? I'll put, by the way, I'll put these slides on um, joined in as well. So if there was anything in there that you wanted to refer back to, it'll be there. <laughs>